So to begin with, to begin with, uh, we're going to uh, look at some something seemingly unrelated to what I'm going to speak about, which is the study of the sine function. Uh, look at the sine function where sine x, where x belongs to uh, zero pi, <clears throat> and ask for the sine of this. Uh, this is of course uh, positive or zero. So I put a plus to say this is positive or zero. Now I'm going to duplicate this uh, sine function and look at the product sine x times sine two x, okay? And again, look at the signs uh, on, on the same interval, x between zero and pi. Uh, it's not difficult to see that you, uh, the previous uh, interval is gonna be split into two sub intervals and the sign is gonna be plus on uh, the first uh, half and minus on the second half. Okay, so nothing very deep in that. Now, if I duplicate once more and I look at the function sine x, sine 2x, sine 4x on the same interval, now each of the previous intervals is going to be split into two sub intervals. And the signs you, you're going to get is plus, minus, minus, plus. Again, plus means positive or zero, minus means negative or zero. Okay, in other words, if you forget about the sign, you had plus, then plus, minus, then plus, minus, minus, plus. Okay. And more generally, if you multiply sine x by sine 2x up to sine 2 to the nx, you get a, a finite sequence called the word on the set of symbols plus and minus, which is, uh, which usually calls an alphabet. Okay. Some letters in an alphabet and you have a word and this word has some lengths. I mean, the number of characters you you can get in the word, you can see in the word, which is two to the n. Okay, so now we can completely forget about the functions, sine x, sine two x, or sine two to the n x, and just look at this rule. We had a rule where you, we were replacing uh, plus by plus minus and minus by minus plus. Hmm? Uh, so I read again what we had, plus goes to plus minus, and then to plus minus minus plus, and so on and so forth. So each interval, I said, when you uh, you multiply by the last sign, uh, split into two parts, and one part, if you had a plus above, you get a plus minus uh, below, and if you had a minus, you get a minus plus, okay? Now, if you, you can continue forever, and you finally get an infinite sequence of, of plus or minus ones. Why do you get an infinite sequence? Because if you look carefully at the previous slide, what you see is that each line begins with the previous one, okay? So for example, plus minus minus plus, line number three begins by line number two plus minus. Plus minus. So that uh, it, it, this is meaningful to say the, the, it has a limit, I mean, in the naive sense, I mean, just get more and more terms. It can also be uh, seen as a limit for the uh, simple conversions. Okay, now I have an infinite sequence of plus or minus ones, and I claim that the sequence is again a fixed point of the same rule. Plus gives plus minus, and minus gives minus plus. Okay, and you, 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 what we have done is to iterate, and you know, it's a little bit like for continuous functions. I mean, if you define a sequence recursively by zk plus one equal f of zk, where f is continuous, if it happens that zk has a limit, l, then f of l equal l. It's exactly what happens here. We have an infinite sequence, which is a fixed point of this uh, bizarre rule, which I call the rewriting rule, plus goes to plus minus, and minus go, goes to minus plus, okay? Uh, such a rule is called a substitution by mathematicians. It's called also a morphism of monoid or morphism of free monoid by computer scientists. And it's also called inflation rule by physicists. But it's, it's the same story. You have a symbol that goes to a word, which is a finite string of symbols, and you iterate. Okay, more precisely, if we want to look at things in more details, we take the sequence of plus or minus we had. Remember, we had these arrows. Okay, and it's not extremely difficult to see that giving this rule, you have u sub 2n equal un, you know, it's a left part of the double arrows, and u 2n plus 1 equal minus un. Okay, it's just saying that, you know, when you when you look at plus, 
the first letter is plus, minus, the first letter is minus, and, and so on and so forth. Okay. In other words, when you split your sequence UN between the two subsequences on the even indexes and on the odd indexes, you get two sequences. One is UN itself, and the other one is negative UN, minus UN. Okay. But what happens if we split one once more? Okay. We, we take, for example, sequence U2N, which is sequence U0, U2, U4, U6, and so on and so forth, and you split it again. Okay. So U2N splits into U4N, which is a sequence U0, U4, U8, U12, and so on and so forth, and, and in, into U4 and U2, which is U2, U6, U10, and so on and so forth. And same thing with the uh, odd indexes. If you split U2 and plus one, the sequence U2 and plus one, which is U1, U3, U5, U7, and so on and so forth, uh, you get two sequences, of course, uh, U1, U5, and so on, and U3, U, U7, and so on and so forth. And it looks that in general, you get twice as many sequences at each step of a tree of sequences. Uh, and ultimately, we get only two distinct sequences because at the first step, remember when we split, when we have split only one time, you got, we have get, got UN and minus UN, the sequence UN and sequence minus UN. And if you do that again, you, you, you stay in the same set of sequences. Okay. But now if you take any sequence VN, random sequence, complicated sequence, whatever you want, you can do the same job. I mean, you can split Vn into even and odd, and then V2n into even and odd, 2n plus 1 into even and odd. It doesn't fit into the slide, I'm sorry. Uh, and I, 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 I've uh, shown the uh, one, two, three, four, fourth step where you split again, and you have V8n, V8n plus 4, and so on and so forth. And so you have a binary tree, which a priori is infinite, and all the sequences, if, if is a sequence V and any sequence, random, complicated, whatever we want, there is no reason why two sequences in this should be equal. But it may, ha it may happen sometimes that, I don't know, maybe Vn plus 6 is the same sequence as V2n, possibly. And it may even be worse, and that the set of all the sequences occurring in the tree is actually finite. It may happen. It was the case with the sequence Un we started from. Okay, so this set of sequences is called the two kernel of the sequence you start from, and in in short, this is a set of all sequences of the kind. <coughs> excuse me, v sub two r n plus j, where n is the the index, r r is anything, and j is between zero and two to the r minus one. I mean, this is exactly those sequences are exactly those one in the tree. Okay. And as I said, it may happen in some exceptional cases, like one with plus and minus that we have seen, that this set is actually finite. Remember, it was only there were only two elements in this set, which were uh, un and negative un. <clears throat> in such a case, the sequence is called two automatic. If it's two kernel, I mean, this set of sequences is called two kernel of the sequence vn. If it's two kernel, it's finite. This is a definition of one of the definitions of the automatic sequence is okay. Uh, for example, a sequence of plus and minus we have just seen before uh, is an example of a two automatic sequence because its two kernel was finite and contained only two elements. Good. Okay, now we're going to see a sequence which is called either the two or more sequence or the Prouet two or more sequence. And it goes back uh, to two papers by Tuer, Norwegian mathematician, and the papers were in German and they appeared in some obscure journal, so they, they were not known at this time. Uh, one paper goes back to 96 and the other to 1912. And among the many questions and answers there were in the paper, uh, uh, Tue, Axel Tue, asked two questions. The first one is, is it possible to find an infinite sequence on two symbols, on two letters, without squares? Here, squares mean for the concatenation rule, means that a square is just two consecutive identical blocks. Hmm? For example, 0, 0 is a square, or 0, 1, 0, 1 is a square. And same question, we replace squares by cubes, where cube is just a concatenation of three identical consecutive blocks. Words. OK. Those were among the questions that we was asking. There was another question, like, is it possible to construct a sequence on three symbols with squares, and so on and so forth. Anyway, the first question is very easy to answer, and we are going to answer it uh, together. Uh, the answer is no. There is no sequence on two symbols 
that does not contain any square in it. Okay, let's try. We can call the symbols zero and one, and we can suppose we begin with zero. Okay, so now we try to extend the zero to obtain a possibly infinite sequence. So the two possibilities are either zero, zero, or zero, one, but zero, zero is forbidden, there's a square in it. So you take, you start from zero, one, and then you try to extend zero, one. You have two possibilities, zero, one, zero, or zero, one, one. Zero, one is forbidden because there's a square one, one. Okay, okay, so we are left with zero, one, zero. And what we're gonna do is to try to extend zero, one, zero. We have two choices, either zero, one, zero, or zero, one, zero, one. And I claim that both are forbidden. Why? Because uh, the first one contains a square, which is zero, zero. And the second one is a square, it's a square of zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Okay, so the answer to the first question was no. And the second question, remember, same question, but replacing, uh, sorry, replacing squares by cubes. Is it possible to get an infinite sequence on two symbols that does not contain any cube? And uh, Tua answered, yes, this is possible. And he gave the following sequence, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0 and so on and so forth, with, with a way of co constructing this sequence. And if you look carefully, of course, it can be proven. Uh, this sequence is exactly the same as the sequence we begin, we have begun with, uh, replacing zeros, I mean, replacing plus by zero and minus by one. So plus, minus, minus, plus, and so on and so forth. So this is the same sequence as uh, the one obtained uh, when we duplicated uh, the sine function. Okay. Um, and this was the beginning of uh, a new, at this time, uh, field, which is now called combinatorics on roots. Uh, which is a, a, a very leading field. Yeah, I mean, even now there are a lot of papers and, and people working on this. Uh, interestingly enough, combinatorics on words can be said either as a branch. I mean, people working in the combinatorics on words are usually uh, seen either as mathematicians or as computer scientists. I mean, theoretical computer scientists. Uh, in France, usually they are uh, computer scientists considered as com computer scientists. Versus, in, for example, in, uh, in America, in, uh, in Canada, or United States, they are considered as uh, mathematicians, I mean, discrete mathematics, doing discrete mathematics. Okay. Remember the paper of, papers of Tour were uh, published in 1906 and 1912, but it happens that Proué, a guy named a mathematician called Proué, uh, published something in 1851, so 16 years, 60 years before, uh, where he asked the following question. It was a short note in the Compte Rendu de l'Académie des Sciences, Proué was French, and there was uh, the note is half a page, I mean, it's very short. And he said, okay, look, I'm interested in, for example, is one of the examples he was interested in, to find a partition of the interval one to, two, to the n by two intervals, i n and j n. So a partition, mean, meaning that the union is a good thing, each one is non-empty and the intersection is empty. Having the following property, first, same cardinality, okay? Second, same sum of elements. The sum of elements in I should be equal to the sum of elements in J. Same sum of squares. Sum of squares of elements in I should be equal to the sum of squares of elements in J, and so on and so forth, up to power n minus one. You can't go any farther, because if you try with n, uh, it's already impossible. Okay, and we say, look, uh, there is a possibility to do that easily, namely, take the sequence which was not called the two more sequence yet, uh, sequence 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and so on, truncate it, for example, for n equal 3, two to the n equal 8, so you want to uh, um, make a partition of 1, 8, and the idea is you take the prefix of length 8 of the sequence of zeros and ones, and you put in i, those guys where the value of the sequence is zero, and in J, those guys for which the value of the sequence is one. Okay, so I equal one, four, six, seven, and J equal two, three, five, eight. Does it uh, satisfy the conditions? Yes, namely, same number of elements, which is four, same sum of elements, which is four plus one plus six plus seven, which is 18, and same number of squares, namely one, oh, sorry, some sum of squares, which is one plus 16 plus 36 plus 49 
which is something like uh, 102, if I'm not mistaken. And and we are done because, you know, n equal to uh, 3, so that we stop at the sum of squares. And it works for any n. Okay. And actually, Rue also noted that this sequence is essentially the sum of digits of n reduced mode 2, uh, probably shifted by 1. And he did the same for instead of 1, 2 to the n, take 1, q, q to the n, where q is any integer uh, larger than 2. Okay. And this problem was called the Tari Escott problem for a long time uh, because there, there was a, a study, a, a paper by Tari and Escott at the beginning of the 20th century where they studied this, uh, this problem and generalization. And finally, uh, the paper of Hue was rediscovered only in 1948. And there is a, a paper by Wright, you know, the Wright of uh, Hardy and Wright, the, the book of number theory, at least uh, when, I was, uh, when I was young. Uh, and the paper of Wright, the title of the paper of Wright is Hue's 1851 solution of the Terry Scott problem of 1910. So it, it was a long time between those two dates. Good. Uh, uh, going back to this sequence uh, of zeros and ones uh, that you've seen over there, I mean, the beginning here, this is a sort of ubiquitous. I mean, the, there is a paper by Jeff Shalit and myself that we entitled the ubiquitous two or more sequence because it occurs in a lot of, of uh, different problems or, or questions. Uh, this is amazing. Okay. Now I'm going to, to, to make a, a little bit of number theory. Uh, take this two or more sequence again, call it MN. Remember, it was 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and so on and so forth. And look at the associated formal power series. Okay. So sigma of M sub N, X to the N. And we're going to consider this coefficient, the coefficients of this series to be reduced mod 2. In other words, F belongs to the uh, uh, ring F2 bracket bracket X. Then we want to, to see what the properties of F are. So as we had previously with M N, with the plus or minus translated into M, gives that M two N equal M N, M N two N plus one equal one minus M N. Okay. And this, of course, we are mod two, so one minus M N or one plus M N is the same. Okay. So that we have. Uh, for f, we are going to split uh, the function series f into the even and odd indices. So first, I mean, the penultimate line is trivial. This is just m2 n x2 to the n plus summation of m2 n plus 1 x2 n plus 1. And then we replace m2 n by m n and m, n, m sub 2 n plus 1 by 1 plus m n. Okay, good. Uh, okay, we group, second line, we group together the, 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 the sums where mn uh, occurs, and we have the remaining sum, which is summation of x to, to, to the n plus 1. And now there is a stupid remark, which is 0 squared equals 0 and 1 squared equal 1, so that uh, on the penultimate line, I've replaced mn by mn squared, which doesn't change anything. Okay, this uh, line is the first line you see here. We are there. And now this is a, the dream uh, of any uh, Frenchman in the studies, freshman, not Frenchman, uh, that the squares, uh, I mean, a plus b squared equal a squared plus b squared, of course, mod 2. So, and it's all, also true for, for infinite sequences, for infinite sums, sorry, so that the big parenthesis here is equal to the very first line, okay, sum of mn squared x2 to the n is the same as sum fn xn squared. Okay, and big parenthesis is nothing but f itself squared. And finally, the remaining sum at the end is just x over 1 minus x squared. Okay, that's okay. So this line, the last line is this minus x squared or plus x squared is the same. And 1 plus x squared is the same as 1 plus x squared. And using again the plus equal minus mod 2, I have this uh, identity for f, which 
is essentially saying that a0 times f squared plus a1 times f plus a2 equals zero, where a1, a0, a1, and a2 are polynomials. In other words, f is an algebraic element over the rational functions mod two. Okay. Okay. Actually, it's even more. It's quadratic. At, at most, quadratic. And we we know it's not uh, rational because we know that the, there is no cubes in it, so it cannot be periodic. I mean, the sequence m n cannot be periodic, so f must be irrational. So finally, f is quadratic. Okay. Good. So what happened? We took a sequence that was too automatic, namely that had a two kernel, a finite two kernel. Okay. And we looked at the corresponding form of a series and uh, it was uh, something algebraic. Actually, this is uh, something quite general. Uh, if you start from any automatic sequence to automatic sequence and you look at the form of a series, you get something algebraic and vice versa. This is a theorem due to Crystal in 1979 uh, and uh, completed by Crystal Kamae, Madas Fons and Rosie uh, one year later in 1980. And the statement is, you have a sequence with values in F2, okay, filled with two elements. It's too automatic. That means that the kernel, two kernel is finite and so on and so forth. If and only if the corresponding formal power series is algebraic over the rational functions mode two. Okay, so we have an algebraic property, which is to be algebraic, which is equivalent to a com purely combinatorial property. Just look at the kernel, two kernel. Aha. Uh -huh. And of course, uh, uh, two is not important. So the theorem more generally says something about Q automatic, where Q is a power of a prime, of a prime number. And we had the same thing. The Q kernel is finite if and only if the associated formal power series is algebraic over FQ. Okay. Good. One direction is not that difficult to prove. Uh, it's essentially what we have done before with the case of the two or more sequence. The other direction is not that difficult uh, as well, a little bit more difficult. But, you know, I could, if I had a blackboard, I could just improvise the, the proof over there. So it's not uh, extraordinarily complicated. Once, once you have found it, of course, as usual. Okay. Mm. Maybe I should mention a kind of analogy. I mean, the usual computation, we have, we have Z, the set of integers, Q, the set of fractions, of rational uh, fractions, and R, which is uh, the real numbers. So similarly, we have the replacing the ring Z by the ring FQ polynomial X, I mean, polynomials uh, with coefficients in FQ. Uh, the field of fractions of that is rational functions with coefficients in FQ. And what corresponds to R is the set of Laurent formal power series with coefficients in FQ. And as I said, if you look at the first sequence here, 0, 1, 1, 0, which is more sequence, we have some patterns. I mean, clearly, uh, since the kernel is finite, it means that there are a lot of relation between the coefficients. And if you compare to root 2 or even to pi, root two is algebraic, pi is not. And essentially nothing is known about the uh, digits, let's say by 10, but it could be the same as in, in any base. Nobody, nothing is known about these digits. Uh, for example, there's an old question of Borel who thinks, who says that uh, uh, root two is a normal number in any base, in particular in base 10, for example, in base 10, that means that each block, each digit, one, two, three, four, zero, uh, occurs infinitely often and with the same frequency, which is one over 10. Every block of two digits should occur, one, 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 two, one, three, and so on and so forth, with the same frequency, which is one over 100. More generally, for each D, each block of D digits should occur, occur with a frequency one over 10 to the D. Okay, that's a nice property, but we are extremely far away from that property. For example, we don't even know whether there's an infinite number of four of the digit four or of any digit in root two. It might well be that from some point on, in base 10, digits of root two would be only zeros and ones. 
of course, there is essentially no chance. And almost everybody is convinced that this number is normal. So in particular, that all digits occur infinitely often with the same frequency. But, you, you know, we, we don't know anything about the digits of root 2, and it's even worse for, for pi, where the same question, uh, uh, the same property is conjectural, and we are extremely far away. We don't even know whether there's an infinite number of, say, zero, zeros in the uh, decimal expansion of pi. Mm -hmm. Now we can ask a reverse question, so to say. So I take the more sequence, 0, 1, 1, 0, and so on. I put a decimal dot in it, and I say, OK, this is a number, real number. Let's say base 2, base 10, whatever. And what can you say about this number? Mm -hmm. OK, it's not rational, again, because the sequence is not periodic from some point on. So it's irrational. But is it transcendental or algebraic? And the answer is, uh, that actually any automatic irrational real number is transcendental. So if you take an uh, automatic sequence, you put a decimal point dot, sorry, a decimal dot, a decimal point, I'm not sure, uh, anywhere, and this gives you a number in some base, and this number is either rational or transcendental. There is a dichotomy. You cannot have something algebraic irrational. You cannot have root two, for example. This. Uh, there were some results by Mahler himself in the 20s about uh, which is now called the Tuomo sequence. There were some uh, deep results by Luxon and Van der Porten, but they, finally there was a gap in, in their results. And there's a work by Nishio. And finally, uh, there was a note au compte rendu de l'Académie des Sciences by Adam Zeski, Bujo, and Luca. And uh, finally, I mean, the nice paper by Adam Zeski and Bujo where they completely uh, ask for the question, uh, which is the first sentence of this slide, but you take out the interrogation. All automatic irrational real numbers are transcendental. Okay. Uh, by the way, this is an easy way of constructing a uh, transcendent number. Huh? You take any automatic sequence, like the Morse sequence, and you put a decimal dot in it, and this gives you a transcendent number. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are other examples of two automatic sequences. There are a lot of examples. I'm just uh, giving two of them. One is the regular paper folding, and the other is the uh, sequence of moves uh, when you uh, solve uh, the Hanoi Tower problem. Okay, regular paper folding, you take a piece of paper hmm, and you fold it once, the part on your uh, right above. And then again, same thing. And then again, and you can you try to do that infinitely, uh, an infinite number of times, which of course is not that easy because it's more and more uh, thick. Uh, and if you unfold it, and if you look at the edge, of it, you unfold it by making right angles, you get a sequence of turns. If you travel on the edge of turns on the left or on the right, if I show you, maybe it's easier to see on that. Uh, okay, you get, and you do that infinitely, an infinite number of times. And so you get the sequence L, L, R, L, L, R, R, was L is for left and R for right. But you can replace by zeros and ones if you want. And this is actually a two automatic sequence. It has a finite two kernel. Another example is with a Hanoi Tower. You know this, uh, this uh, puzzle, I mean, this game. You have three uh, pegs and you have disks with numbers of size, say, 1 to n. And you begin with, with a small disk on the top, and then this number 2 up to this number n. And the game consists, at any step, you can take any disk which is on the top of any peg, and you can move it on another peg, provided that you never move it on a smaller one. You can move, move it only on a larger one, not necessarily the next one, but on a larger one. Uh, of course, you have six possibilities. If you take a disk from any peg to put it, top disk of any peg to put it on another peg, you have six possibilities. So six moves, so six letters. And maybe I can have a picture, yeah. Uh, so that should be uh, seen from top to bottom and then from left to right. So you start with, on, on the picture number zero, you start with the tower with four disks. Then you move the small one. Then you move this, the next one, and of course you cannot move it to the uh, to the peg in the middle, but only to the third one. 
then you move the, the small one to the third peg. Then you move the the, the, the the number whatever number three from the first peg to the second, and so on and so forth. And you see, for example, that uh, at at step uh, seven we have uh, finished the program if they had only uh, three disks. Okay, so uh, it can be proven that uh, there is a, a sequence on an alphabet with six letters. So that if you truncate it, if you cut it uh, to get only a prefix of length two to the n minus one, this gives you the moves to do to uh, move all the disks from the first peg to another peg, and it's optimal. Uh, and I forgot to say that this sequence on six letters is, of course, uh, automatic, too automatic. Actually. Good. Uh, there are a lot of examples. Maybe I'm I'm not going. Uh, give more examples over there. Uh, so automatic sequences are uh, very can be found in many places in mathematics. I mentioned combinatorics, like combinatorics on roots, for example. I mentioned transcendence in number theory. Uh, there's a question of continued fractions. Hmm. Uh, you know, if you if you are in the, in the usual framework of real numbers, uh, if you uh, expand a real number uh, as a continued fraction, uh, you get something which is periodic or ultimately periodic if and only if the number you started from is quadratic. Okay. Uh, and now there is sort of a question or a conjecture, it's not clear, by that goes back to Kinchin, who says, okay, take a continued fraction and suppose that all cushion, uh, partial quotients that occur are. Take only a finite number of values. There's a finite, they are bounded. There's only a finite number of partial equations. Can you uh, be sure that the corresponding real number is transcendental or quadratic? So suppose that it is not rational, so the continued fraction is infinite. If the thing is, if the expansion is a periodic or periodic from some point on, then you get something quadratic. Uh, if not, is it true that you get something transcendental? We don't know anything about that. A general uh, statement, uh, but we may restrict ourselves to the case where not only the partial equations take only a finite number of values, but also that the sequence of values is itself, let's say, automatic, too automatic, Q automatic. And then there is a very nice result, again, again due to Adam Zesky and Bujot, you know, those guys who proved the thing for, for, uh, 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 real numbers, namely, uh, if you take an irrational uh, real number, so you have two k, and you suppose that the number of partial quotients occurring in the uh, continued fraction expansion of this number, uh, this number is finite, so there are only a finite bounded number of partial quotients. Uh, then, you either the continued fraction is so to say trivial, meaning quadratic, or the number of Corresponding number is transcendental. So this is another way of constructing a transcendental number. You take uh, two more sequence, let's say with values one and two, and you, you say, okay, those are the partial equations of some real number. And this number must be, is actually, this is a theorem, is transcendental. Uh, there is actually another question with automatic sequences in continued fractions. Remember this analogy, Z, Q, R, and F, Q, bracket X, F, Q, parenthesis X, and F, Q, double parenthesis X. Uh, in the last one, replace X by X to the minus one. And there is a theory of continued fractions for, for, for this uh, Laurent series. And in this framework, uh, we can say more than what, what we can say in the, in the real uh, framework, namely, there is a, a paper, of, for example, by Baum and Sweet, uh, in the last century, of course, uh, saying that there exists a continued fraction expansion of some Laurent series uh, in characteristic two, having partial equations uh, taking a finite number of values, those values are polynomials, of course, and which is cubic. Okay, And for example, in the real framework, we don't even know whether root cube uh, of two has uh, 
uh, bounded partial quotients or not. Actually, we don't know anything about the, the uh, uh, partial quotients of any algebraic number, which is not quadratic. OK. Uh, there are also uh, uh, results uh, that have to do with distribution model 1 and results with Dirichlet series. For example, if you look at the uh, Pure two more sequence from the very beginning, you know, the one with plus and minus, and look at the, for, uh, the Dirichlet series, uh, sigma of this uh, quantity divided by n to, to the s, uh, it clearly converges for a real part of s larger than one, but it is not difficult to see that you can, um, uh, what would extend this uh, Dirichlet series to an entire function, a function which is holomorphic on the whole plane. And there's also, maybe not exactly this sequence, but some small variation of this uh, Dirichlet series. There is something amusing. Uh, if you look at the zeros of this uh, Dirichlet series, you have what I would call trivial zeros, which are on the, uh, uh, which are the negative integers, okay? And there are non-trivial zeros, of course, I mean others, and we know some of them, they all are on a straight line, vertical straight line, which is real part of S equals zero, not a half. Uh, and of course, you it's tempting to, to, to make a conjecture saying that they are all, all non-trivial zeros are on this line. Huh? Uh, we don't know. This is probably very good, and that probably has no interest at all, except that's a nice problem that resembles uh, the Riemann uh, hypothesis. But you know, there is no reasonable application for prime numbers of whatever. Okay. Um, what else? Yeah. You can have such sequences in harmonic analysis and also in iterations of unit functions, in fractals, and so on. First, for example, in harmonic analysis, take a sequence of plus or minus one, any sequence of plus or minus ones, and look at the sort of uh, discrete uh, Fourier transform sigma for small n larger, uh, smaller than capital N of this plus or minus, uh, exponential to i by n theta, and look at the supremum of the absolute value of this, the infinite norm. What can you say on this norm? How does it behave asymptotically, asymptotically when, when uh, capital N goes to infinity? Well, there is first a trivial upper bound. It's smaller than capital N, not difficult. Uh, there is a almost uh, trivial, actually easy uh, lower bound, which is root n. Why? Because you can bound it from below by the L2 norm, and the L2 norms in the characters are orthogonal, gives you uh, exactly root n. Okay. So between root n and n. Now, uh, there is a result that says if you take a random sequence, essentially, if you take uh, almost all sequences, you have a bound, an upper bound in root of n log n. So for a random sequence, you are between root n and root n log n. And the question, there is a question, is it possible to find a deterministic sequence, whatever deterministic means, that makes this uh, quantity as small as possible, so as close uh, to root n as possible uh, to make the thing sort of flat. And the answer is yes. We can have a, uh, a bound of the kind constant times root n. And there was two. There were two independent papers, one by Shapiro, uh, working in, in math, uh, exhibiting such a sequence. And actually it was proven independently by Gollet, uh, I guess the same year or probably the year before. And Gollet was uh, working in, in uh, signal theory or something like this. And this sequence was called at some point the Rudin-Shapiro sequence, but it shouldn't be called that way because Rudin worked on it, but he, he acknowledges at, in some paper, the, he acknowledges priority for Shapiro. But it, yeah, of course it happens that Rudin was sitting in the committee of the master thesis and on the uh, PhD thesis of Shapiro. And Shapiro had this in thesis. So, uh, okay, anyway. Uh, iteration of continuous functions. You probably know about this uh, thing. You have a, a continuous function from 0, 1 to 0, 1, which is unimodal. That means it goes, uh, it's increasing and then decreasing. And say f, and say f lambda, it depends in some reasonable way of a parameter lambda. 
And when lambda varies, what happens is your function has first a fixed point. It has always a, fi a fixed point, but this fixed point is attractive. And then there's a cycle of length two, which is attractive. And then a cycle of length four, which is attractive and so on and so forth two to the end. And uh, finally, when n goes to infinity, you have a Cantor set, which is attractive. Uh, this is called um, a Feigenbaum cascade, and it's sort of universal. Whatever the uh, family of sequences, unimodal uh, uh, functions, f sub lambda, that you look at, subject to some conditions, of course, then you always have the same, the same uh, scheme of bifurcations, and you have the same some sort of universal constant behind and so on and so forth. And it happens that uh, there is a, func uh, a sequence hidden behind, which is closely related to the two more sequence. And this is known as the period doubling sequence. Uh, Uses to say that the period doubling sequence is too automatic. I also forgot to say that the, the example of Gole and Shapiro is also automatic, a two automatic sequence. OK. And as you can guess, this property of, remember the tree of uh, F? V, V, N, V, 2, N, V, 2, N, V, 2, N, V, 2, N, and so forth. The fact that so many sequences are equal means something of a sort of self similar whatever this means. And so you can guess that uh, some fractals can enter the picture, or or even more, or less, I don't know, uh, that some fractals can be generated by, by automatic sequences. And there is an example, sort of easy. You look at the Pascal triangle, would, uh, modulo D. And you generalize the concept of automatic sequences to two-dimensional sequences, which is not that difficult. And amazingly, uh, the fact that the double sequence you obtain, two-dimensional sequence you obtain, is or is not automatic, is related to the fact that D is or is not a uh, power uh, of a prime number. OK? So for D equal three, five, seven, you get uh, uh, three automatic or five automatic or seven automatic sequence. The same for, for eight, you get a two automatic sequence. And for, for example, six, yeah, well, you have two di distinct prime numbers. Uh, you uh, have something which is, which is not Q automatic, whatever Q is. Okay, good. And there are many things again uh, to say about this, but maybe it's enough for mathematics for today. I mean, for applications in mathematics. Uh, in computer science, in theoretical computer science, automatic sequences do occur, like for the study of finite automata. That, by the way, this is the way, the reason why automatic sequences are called automatic is because there exists uh, some model, which is an abstract automaton, which is essentially a graph plus some, some, some conditions that uh, generates uh, uh, automatic sequence. Combinatorix on words was already mentioned, theory of languages also. OK, so this is uh, again uh, something which is sometimes called combinatorix on words, sometimes called discrete mathematics. Uh, what about physics? You know, when you take automatic sequences, maybe I convinced you, or maybe not yet, that either they are periodic, ultimate periodic, or they are not periodic, <laughs> which is a big deal. But not periodic means that they are still regular in some sense, OK? So you are between order, regularity, periodicity, and chaos, randomness, let's say, but probably a little bit closer to, to order than to, 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 to chaos. And some people describe this as being a controlled disorder. I mean, the sequence is disordered, an automatic sequence, which is not periodic, is disordered, but not that much. And you, you have a sort of control on it. and so. That's the reason why it can be used in math for things that are somehow at the limit between, uh, let's say, order and chaos, as I wrote. Same thing for, 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 for um, computer science, same thing for physics. For example, there was maybe it was one of the first occurrence of uh, finite automata, not a cellular automata, finite automata in physics by Mendes France and myself. He had, uh, Mendes France had the idea of looking at the uh, one dimensional Ising model, the Ising or Ising. Uh, it was not English, so one should say easing. The easing model in one dimension is a sort of uh, toy model of magnetism. Magnetism, And the idea of Mendes France was to take, instead of taking a, a temperature, like usual, there's a parameter in it called temperature, it takes an imaginary temperature. And then 
the usual my method for solving this easing model, which is due to Kramers and Vanier, um, gives you something about the uh, distribution mode one of, of some sequence is quite unexpected. And of course, the second point I would like to insist on of is quasi crystals. Uh, again, some people say quasi crystals and some others quasi crystals. And one colleague told me once, uh, as I was educated in Oxford, I'm saying quasi crystals. So, I try to be snobbish as well and see quasi crystals. Uh, yeah, two dates Penrose, 74, Cheshman, Blech, Gracias, and Khan, 84. In 74, Penrose wrote a paper, published a paper entitled The Role of Aesthetics in Pure and Applied Mathematics. Uh, Okay, the papers say blah, 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 blah. And suddenly he showed this picture, actually not this one exactly, but something related to this picture. And if you look at it, this is a tiling of the plane in, in, with two sort of ties, uh, arrows and dots. You know, the dots are the convex ones and the arrows are the one that looks like the, uh, the end of an arrow. Okay. So they tie the plane without holes, without, without uh, overlap. And if you look carefully at it, it is not periodic. Sometimes it begins like it's going to be periodic, but it is not. The, the thing breaks, uh, the periodicity is, is broken. Uh, but there is some sort of regularity, hence the title of the paper, The Role of Aesthetics in Pure and Applied Mathematics. Um, Maybe you can imagine there is something what the physicist could, would call a symmetry of order five. So if you make a rotation of two pi over five, it seems to be some kind of invariance of that. Okay, that was in uh, in uh, seventy four, as I said, and people noted maybe at that time or maybe later, I'm not sure, that if you look at some uh, pieces of this styling like this, and if it's one of the more regular Penrose stylings of this kind, then you got a sequence, which is infinite, actually, if you have tied the whole plane, which is uh, composed of bow ties, uh, long vertical bow ties, uh, long ones and short ones, and that uh, the sequence of short and long is essentially given, this is called the worm, I forgot to say, this is called the worm, and the worms uh, follow the following sequence, which is obtained as a fixed point of zero goes to zero one and one goes to zero. You see, that's not exactly like the two more sequence, but it's sort of the same kind of mechanism. Okay, good. So people were interested in that, why not? And that was in 74 and in 84, Sheshman uh, succeeded in uh, in constructing some material, some, uh, some solid. Uh, actually, the very first one was very thin. Uh, taking an alloy of aluminum and manganese, uh, melting it, and then freezing it very quickly. And that gave something very unexpected. Uh, namely, if you make a, a diffraction by X-rays, a diffraction scheme of this uh, material, you get atoms that are disposed on, on something that resembles this, not exactly, but of the same kind. But this is forbidden up to, the, to 80, 84. Uh, there were uh, only two kinds of solids, or two kinds of um, uh, materials, crystals, and they obey the rules of crystallography that are very strict. And in particular, there is no symmetry of order five permitted, or they are sort of random, which is the case, for example, for the glass of uh, the window. Okay, so that was extremely uh, surprising uh, to get this. And this was called later on quasi crystals because he, a quasi crystal because it was not a crystal, a crystal, but it was not that far from being one. So again, between order and chaos, and so to say. Okay, so then physicists become very interested in this kind of thing, in this kind of thing as well. By the way, if you iterate this, you see that the lengths at each step are given by one, two, three, five, eight, which are the Fibonacci numbers, and so the sequence, the infinity sequence of order, is called the binary Fibonacci sequence or the Fibonacci binary sequence, whatever. And of course, this opens the way to uh, some kind of generalization of automatic sequences instead of taking something which is called of constant length. Remember, for most we had 
zero goes to zero one, one goes to one zero, so same length, length two on the on the right of the arrows. But now, if you permit to have any length, not necessarily the same, then you get something more general than automatic sequences, and you can you can do a lot of things on that. Okay, two quick anecdotes about quasi crystals. The first one is um, Schechtman, Blech, Gracias, and Can. Remember four names for the paper, and Gracias, uh, French uh, French guy. A very nice French guy in the in the authors suddenly thought, okay, if uh, if the Nobel Prize gives a prize, a Nobel Prize, the number of authors should be at most three, and we are four, so it doesn't get, it doesn't work. So he wrote this Nobel Committee saying, look, we are four, but I was there only by chance, you know, nothing to do with that. So if someday you want to give a Nobel Prize, please take my name out of this. You can give the Nobel Prize to the other uh, authors. Uh, honestly, I don't know anyone uh, who who have done the same thing. Take saying take my name out if you want to give a Nobel Prize. And as you know, there was a Nobel Prize given a little bit later, some years later, uh, recent sort of recently to Schechtman. Actually, he was a discoverer, and uh, and there were many guys saying, "Oh, why not? Why not the others? Why not the French?" Come on, the French himself says, "You know, I'm j was just here by chance." And the second anecdote is that uh, Schechtman was a candidate to any some sort of election in Israel, maybe president. He had no chance anyway, but he was he was candidate and he got only one vote. And the day after, newspapers had the title, the quasi-president. Okay, a uh, little bit about music. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm late, I don't know, that's okay. Uh, my, my, my first uh, claim, my first thesis, my prolegomenon is that there is no relation between math and music, and math can be a tool, but only a tool. And I, I will develop this uh, uh, statement, so to say, in uh, the third talk I'm going to give, uh, where I will in particular speak of what uh, uh, some composers like Marcel Frémiaux, like Tom Johnson, like Christopher Adler uh, made uh, with me about uh, using mathematics in uh, musical compositions, in particular uh, Tom Johnson is a minimalist, so you can imagine that if you're a minimalist, like, you use uh, very uh, strict rules and models. And also, Order and Chaos again, you know, if you if you uh, listen to the uh, fireman uh, car in France, it makes wah, 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 wah. it's very regular, periodic, nothing to say. So Order, no interest in music. And on the chaotic side, if you are uh, near a highway, and you, you listen to the, the cars, it's completely chaotic and it's certainly probably not music. So music is, so to say, in between, which of course is not a big deal. If I say that, I don't I don't say anything interesting. Okay, I, I'm gonna finish with a, a, a story about a bored child. A bored child is myself. And when I was young, very young, it happened often that I went to my mother and said, mother, you know, I'm bored, I'm bored, what can I do? And as, uh, uh, old mothers, she tried to have ideas of things that they could do to to stop being bored. And among the things that she uh, showed me, one time there was this picture. And she said, you know, I forgot where I learned this picture, but okay, I tried to do this uh, in a sort of continuous way without taking the pen out of the, of the paper and train. And when you know how to do this, try to generalize that because she said, I, I succeeded in, succeed in general that instead of four by four, you can do eight by eight, or you can do even more, okay? Many, many, many years later, I found a paper, it was probably in a lecture notes in computer science by Indian colleagues where they were studying a similar, a similar picture. And also I heard a, a talk uh, by Marc Chemillier who explained that this kind of picture was found in India, of course, uh, I'm going to, to speak more about that, but also in Africa, in the Vanuatu Islands, and so on and so forth. Okay, if you forget about the loops, you get this, which is sort of simplified version. You just replace the loops by something, uh, and you recognize the surface curve. Now you can imagine of traveling, you start from the corner, top left corner, you go to the right uh, down corner, and the down now right corner, and you, you follow the edge and you see whether you make a left or a right. 
So left, right, right, left, 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 right, right, and so on and so forth. And this you're gonna have it just by symmetry. And if you do the same, just for the first half, instead of four by four, you take eight by eight, 16 by 16, and so on and so forth, to get finally an infinite sequence of left and right, which I'm going, going to call two and one. And what sequence do you obtain? Uh, well, uh, uh, take this Italian sequence of zeros and ones and put exponents with these twos and ones. So you have one, zero, one, zero, then you put the exponents two, one, one, two, 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 one, one, which is a sequence you, uh, that is uh, written in red uh, at the beginning of the slide. And of course, one squared means one, one, and one to the one means one, so that, uh, the sequence you obtain is this one, where, uh, okay, we have nothing. If you if you stick, if you put a zero in front of the sequence, what you get, you probably recognize the two more sequence, which as I said, is ubiquitous. Uh, okay, to go back to this picture, uh, to the picture of the beginning, uh, you certainly know uh, this picture, and you know the, uh, the, the fact of drawing such pictures with uh, rice powder in front of a house for different reasons, I mean, aesthetics, uh, philosophical, religious, uh, whatever, uh, which is called a kalam. Uh, some, some in other parts of India, this is called a kolam or a rangoli. And uh, there, there are many mathematics, uh, many things of many mathematical things that can be done with this, that us that have been done with this. Uh, and this is, this was, I mean, there is a field of mathematics that is called ethnomathematics, where uh, mathematicians, I mean, people that call them, themselves mathematicians, take a piece of art, like pieces of art, like uh, drawing, like music, like even games, puzzles, and so on and so forth, that uh, some people do uh, for religious aesthetics, philosophical, just fun, play uh, reasons, and they know that there are indeed uh, mathematics behind. And not only there are mathematics be behind, but also in the, in the practice of, of people doing this music or uh, drawings and so on, some uh, uh, behaviors are actually proofs. And it's very really amazing that it's a cool uh, field of mathematics and you probably know uh, many things in this, in this direction. Uh, I think I will stop here and ask for a question and Andy thank you very much okay thank you very much you would be able to take one or two questions Hey, pardon me? Yeah. Questions? I can can I somebody I don't know whether anybody is ready to ask some question or yes, yes, please. I mean I am I would be happy to answer a question <laughs> if I know the answer, of course. Anybody? Or is Stefan? Not there, the music man. Because we had a mathematician who is a pianist. He also lectured different and approximation and music. Maybe I don't know. He missed this talk. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so thank you once again so, uh, for your beautiful lecture. We'll meet tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.